Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi, coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, our guest is Dr. Anna Yusim. I am so excited to have us her here. Um, Anna is a world-renowned, award-winning, Stanford and Yale-educated, board-certified psychiatrist. So she's a little bit smart with a private practice in New York City and Connecticut. She is also on the clinical faculty at Yale Medical School and is the best-selling author of Fulfilled, How the Science of Spirituality Can Help. She's also a media expert and frequent contributor on CNN, Fox News, NBC, and ABC. She has authored over 100 articles and over 70 academic articles and book chapters, scientific acts, abstracts, and book reviews on various topics in psychiatry. Dr. Yusem felt that something was missing in her life. And so she went on a quest to find it, and she traveled and lived all over the world while studying Kabbalah, learning Buddhist meditation, and working with South American shamans and Indian gurus. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. That's quite a journey to get you to where you are today. I am so excited and honored to have you on, as my guest. Um, one of the things I really wanted to talk about um, is, you know, there always seems to be this separation between spirituality or alternative medicine and hardcore conventional medicine. And I believe that when the two shake hands, not only will the healing start more rapidly, but perhaps we'll get some big time curings. So how do you feel about that? Absolutely. Thank you, Anne. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think that unfortunately, there is such a divide between science and spirituality oftentimes. And I feel that's part of my purpose. And I guess part of your purpose by virtue of having someone like me on your show is helping to bridge that divide. And why the divide? I think because the divide comes about from having two disciplines that come at knowledge from different ways. It's hard to study spirituality because often spirituality is a deeply subjective, transcendent experience. So people are trying and are, you know, have for a long time already been continuing to try. Whereas science has the scientific method, which is reproducible, repeatable, something that is empirical, easily observed, and that everybody can agree upon. It's very objective. So the subjectivity of spirituality and the objectivity of science makes them odd bedfellows. And so how do you bridge the gap? People are in so many ways trying to do that by starting to study spirituality in scientific ways and then using spirituality to help people heal from a lot of illnesses where unfortunately Western medicine only does a little bit and can't get people to complete and full healing. How do you combine the spirituality in your practice? So in my practice as a psychiatrist, I try to study the whole person to the degree that I'm able. And I understand everything that I am able to from a person that they're able to share with me about their body. And that includes their history, when depression or anxiety or when their symptoms started, their medications that they have taken, what's worked, what hasn't, medical conditions, genetics, family history. But then there's this whole other side that often isn't allowed for in conventional psychiatry or science, and that's really the spiritual history. And that's how people connect to the deepest part of themselves, to the divine. That's their connection to something greater than themselves. For some people, that something greater is God. For other people, it's source, mother nature, or even a set of collective values that elevates human consciousness, like peace and harmony and perseverance and hope and trust. So whatever it is, whatever your something greater is, one's connection to that and being aligned with that in your everyday life can really aid your healing. And that's been shown through many different scientific studies in many different ways. So how do you get people to acknowledge that and then connect to it? And so the whole thing is for me as a psychiatrist is to meet people where they're at. I don't feel that I want to you know, change anybody's mind per se but I actually want to better understand who they are. And if they're not spiritual, because I certainly have plenty of people who aren't spiritual and they want to come and they have depression and anxiety, 
we meet them where they're at. And we think about the psychology, the biology, the sociology, the social factors that lead to their symptoms. But then if they are, and if they have an opening to spirituality, we go much deeper into there. And then we figure out in what way is your spiritual connection right now a little bit depleted? Or in which way, in what ways are you misaligned with your own soul? So many people come to me because they actually are disconnected from themselves. They're living the lives that they feel that they should be living because that's what somebody told them. That's what society said. That's what their mother said. And they don't even realize that they're playing these old tapes that aren't even their own. And so part of my work with them is trying to, you know, disentangle who are you and what are all those other voices that are trying perhaps to convince you that it's you but really aren't you. You know, it's interesting because with depression, anxiety, suicide, drugs running rampant, you know, in the world today and, you know, in particular in the United States, do you feel that that there's a lack of spiritual connection and that if, if these people move toward that spiritual connection, we would be able to harness this and maybe stop some of these problems? Absolutely. I feel that not in all cases, certainly, because depression, anxiety, there is many different factors, but a disconnection from one's own soul is often a factor. And it's not really something that is part of the lexicon of modern psychiatry. You know, I went to Stanford, I went to Yale, the word soul really wasn't used in my training. That's something that only later, when I started working with shaman in South Africa and South America and started studying Kabbalah, I got interested in this concept of a soul and what is a soul anyways and why are we not taught that in school if that's such an integral part of a human being. So and what so do you my think favorite, soul is? Yeah. Tell me what you yeah. think the soul is. So I went around the world asking many different people that exact question and my favorite answer came to me from a shaman in Mexico, Fernando Broca. He said that the soul is composed of two parts. The first part of the soul is that which encapsulates your uniqueness. And that is your unique set of talents, skills, your life purpose, why you have come into this world and how you can share light with the world in only the way that you can. The second part of the soul is the part that connects us to everything and everybody. Often you can hear that they say, you're one, we're all one unified soul, and that's what they mean. And so the soul is actually this bipartite thing, which is our uniqueness as well as our interconnectedness. So do you think the soul reincarnates and learns its lessons over eons? Yeah, absolutely. I, I believe that. And I, I believe, you know, certainly that, you know, there's many different ages of souls, that our soul comes with certain lessons that it's supposed to learn, that we have a soul family. So certain people feel very familiar when we meet them. Absolutely. And what about coming into this world with um, certain notions or predispositions, such as somebody born perhaps with depression, you know, um, and they come to you, um, perhaps like they're 25. I don't know where this came from. I've been like this my whole life. Can you connect that back to either their ancestors? We studied with shamans. So there's a lot of ancestral work with shamans or to past lives they've had. Does that come up in your work at all? Absolutely, that comes up. And what I try to do in cases like that, if people are open, I'll suggest things like that. But often I'll say something like, if you are given a certain challenge in this lifetime, and if it's a challenge that you are working so hard in every way to overcome, then it's something that's really, really key to your identity and to your purpose in this world. So if you have depression and if you've overcome that, there probably are so many other people that you need to help with what you've learned through this process. Often my people who come, especially early on with these kinds of things, are my healers. They're the ones who eventually go become therapists, psychiatrists, doctors of some sort. And they were given their own burden in order to make them stronger, to make them more compassionate and empathic of other people who they have to heal down the road. Well, that's pretty wonderful that you're able to do that with people and that they're comfortable in moving forward with that because I really do believe that's what the world needs. You know, also there's so many people who fear death. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, I think a lot of the reason why I'm so busy is because people want some validation that the people they love didn't just fall off and go into the abyss. How do you deal with death anxiety? It's such a great question. And in my book, I have a whole chapter about so many experiences I have, I've had with people who are going through grief. 
number of experiences. You, of course, are a medium. You have very, very direct connection to the other side. So I've had numerous patients come right after the death of a loved one, and we're sitting in a room, and then a mirror will fall off my wall. The lights will start flickering. And these are all different cases. You know, In another case, um, it was a young um, person whose partner just committed suicide, and the person was very, very distraught. And we were talking about, where is the partner now? And suddenly the little buzzer falls off of my wall. And, you know, like the, the, the door buzzer that I have to use to let everybody in. And on one hand, a buzzer falling off a wall isn't the strangest thing, but it's never happened before or since. So, you know, we interpreted it that this was the person who had passed, letting us know that this person was all right. And it was very reassuring and it's really powerful. And it's not just that that happened, but that that happened in the presence of somebody else, somebody who cared for you. The fact that we were able to witness it together and it made it more real. And then we were able to make the meaning of it that was really helpful to the patient. And how does that help them with embracing their own immortality? Yeah, right, because right. at the end of the day, whatever grief we have about the passing of others really comes down to our own fear of mortality, right? Because the only truth in life, right, is that uh, like the one thing you know, is that all of us, everything is fatal, that everything ends, sadly. So some people are more aware of that death anxiety. Other people are less aware of death anxiety. Those people who are less aware, it can come out in actually sometimes very interesting behaviors. There's this thing called a counterphobia, which is when you actually do the exact opposite of what you most fear. So somebody who is very, very afraid of death, will start to do a lot of daredevil things. They'll ride motorcycles, they'll skydive, they'll you know, do all of these things, jump from planes, um, in order to defy their own fear, kind of to convince themselves, I'm not scared, death doesn't bother me, uh-uh, and I'm gonna prove it to myself by doing all of these things that defy death. So I've had patients like that, where that can also become its own addiction. It's very, very interesting. And outside of therapy, how can, like, we're all connected. Like, when I see people, I see energy dots. And I can see how the energy dots go into each other. Um, how do you think that could help us globally heal each other? Yeah, I think this is, you know, part of the definition of soul, that part of all of our souls are connected to one another. And it's a very, very deep concept because we think of ourselves as separate entities and individuals. We think that, you know, the more I get, the less you get, the less you get, the more I get, things of that nature. But it's the opposite. The more that you help to elevate other people, the more that you get in return. And whenever you try to hurt somebody, whenever you have a vengeance in your heart, anger, hatred, whatever it is, hurting another does not you know, benefit you. And it's such a powerful concept, but our world is predicated on a win-lose mentality. That's how I think this concept of interconnectedness and unity actually really is the cornerstone of peace. And what about coincidences? And, you know, within all of that, you know, we come through in soul groups, um, as you said before, soul families, and we're, in, we're interconnected with each other. And so is there such a thing as coincidence or synchronicity? Definitely, yeah. So this is synchronicity is a term coined by Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung, one of my, you know, peeps from way yeah, back. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about and, that, because this ring yeah, is so yeah. Jungian. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I love Carl Young. Yeah, he's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And he coined that um, term in order to denote a meaningful interaction between two unrelated things. Like when one thing doesn't cause another thing, but somehow they're meaningfully connected or, you know, this coincidence. And a synchronicity is very, very powerful. And what makes it a synchronicity is the meaning that you ascribe to it. And so you somehow view it as coincidental. Like you think about somebody and they call you, or you have a dream about somebody and you bump into them on the street, right? And I feel like my own personal feeling, which probably is very much in line with yours, is when we have a lot of positive synchronicities in close succession, it's the universe saying, keep going, you're on the right track. Whereas the opposite, if you have a number of negative synchronicities, for whatever reason, nothing is working, and it's like crazy things happening, it's like, you know, change course, you're a little bit off, look within yourself, what isn't aligned? And I think synchronicities are a very powerful form of guidance and connection for people. And it's a powerful way of knowing that we all really have this divine perspective and that we can just tap into. And it's one of the ways the divine can externally speak to us. You know, the way that the divine can internally speak to us is actually intuition. So the internal voice is intuition. The external voice is synchronicity. So how would you 
you know, personally define divinity? I think divinity is a connection to something greater than oneself. It's sort of my, you know, definition of spirituality. And I don't think divinity necessarily is something that is religious or, you know, or even spiritual per se. For some people, it could be mother nature. That could be their most, you know, divine experience is hiking in the forest and connecting to the trees and the mountains, the most beautiful thing. And for other people, their something greater is a collective consciousness, a Carl Jung term, or there's something greater is if, you know, there's plenty of atheists who have deep connections to the so-called divine. And that's people who believe in certain values that have a transcendent vibration to them, like hope, trust, and perseverance. So the divine is whatever it is deep within you that enables you connect to connect to something greater than yourself. So I think that kind of, I would describe that in a different way because to me, divinity is a vibration. It's the highest vibration of love. So yes, an atheist who's a good person um, can connect to that divine spark, the vibration within. And I think that pretty much says everything that you just said, like connecting yeah. to nature, the vibration of nature, you know, um, it's across the board. So it doesn't have to be within a religious setting. Okay. So if it is, it is, but if it's not, it's beyond that and definitely connects to the collective unconsciousness and our compassion toward each other. So it's a raising up of um, the vibration into the compassion, which I think is really what we need right now. And I think that's one of the reasons why we had to go through COVID, you know, is to look at all of these wrongs that have happened in this world that we as a human race has have created, you know, um, to get us to that other place. So you wrote this wonderful book called Fulfilled, okay? Um, why, why did you, what, did, what was your mission in writing this book? What did you want to bring to people? Yeah, I wrote it for several reasons. So that was about 10 years into my practice and I was starting to integrate spirituality in very, you know, big ways to the degree that I was able with patients, if a patient was interested. And I was running it by my colleagues, but a lot of colleagues, were skeptical and a lot of colleagues were actually very very curious how are you doing that what are you doing so I wrote this book in part for my colleagues but also for other people because I can work with X number of people in my own little practice but there's so many other people who need the help who want the help who are desperately looking <clears throat> for the way in which to connect science and spirituality so it's a little bit of a how-to manual and in the course of the book there's about 50 cases from my patients that I chronicle talking about what we did, what the patients came in with, where the struggle originated from, and what we did to help them align with their soul and get to their next level. I think it's wonderful that you're able to talk to your colleagues about this. You know, when Brian Weiss came out, who, um, if you know, people don't know who he is, he's pretty much the father of past life regression in this country. Okay, um, I think he was. A, was he a psychiatrist as well? Not only was he a psychiatrist, but we went to the same medical school to Yale. Oh, there you go. Um, something must happen there. That's really pretty yeah. phenomenal. Something magical. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he came out and he was not very accepted by the medical community at first. You know, now he's like a household word um, or household name. Um, how has the medical community accepted what you do and what you speak about? Yeah. And so I had, you know, as I was coming out with this, I felt it was so important to do. I felt it was my purpose. It was my mission. I needed to do it. But then I had so much trepidation because precisely that my colleagues are going to think I'm a little crazy, a little this, a little that. And thank God, actually, the exact opposite happened. I had a number of senior colleagues step up and write reviews of my book in top journals. That was wonderful. And then after, it was after my book came out that Yale, where I went to medical school, offered me to come on their clinical faculty. And together with the professors there, the, um, Bob Rohrbach, the associate training director, we are creating a spirituality mental health center. And so it actually had, you know, my fears were not founded, thank goodness. And what it did was it got a lot of actually psychiatrists reading the book and then reaching out to me to either be their psychiatrist or be their supervisor for cases like this. So to me, it was just a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's much more than I could have hoped. And it's been just a wonderful way of being able to share this with the world, but in a way that, you know, you're not overwhelming, you're not putting, overwhelming anybody or pushing anything on anybody who's not interested. You know, I uh, talked to you briefly about this before. There's three types of people when I talk about the people to whom I'm writing, right? There's the converted. The converted is like you and I who believe in spirituality. We're already spiritual. Then there's the open-minded skeptics, and then there's the closed-minded skeptics. 
but closed-minded skeptics would never even pick up a book like mine anyway. And no matter what evidence you present to them, they're closed-minded, they're not interested. But it's the open-minded skeptics, the people who, if you give them some scientific evidence and share your own, you know, things that ex happen in your life, both scientific studies as well as clinical experiences and personal experiences, they're the ones whose mind you can change. And so this is my primary audience, the converted and the open-minded skeptics. So how do we get the world to overcome hatred and the disconnect? Yeah, that's a beautiful question and such an important question. And I feel that that's actually, I've been doing a ton of these different podcasts lately, and it's really this question. How do we overcome the divisiveness? How do we have more unity? How do we have more love? And at the end of the day, everybody has to do their work on themselves. And you have to look out into the world, see what it is that is most bothersome to you. And for you, it's, you know, for most of us, it's hatred, divisiveness, what's going on in the outside world. And then we find antecedents of that within us. We look at our own hatred. We look at our own, you know, prejudices, divisiveness, whatever, and we start working on that. And as we start to change our inner world, then our outer world begins to change as well. That's, I think, the most powerful way to change what's out there is by looking within. So do you think it's like a domino effect? I look within, I see where my issues are around hatred and divisiveness, and then the world starts to see me different, and I'm able to treat people, and then they treat people differently because they start becoming more introspective? I think that's one of the mechanisms. And the other way is that as you start to shift and elevate your own vibrational frequency, you start to draw into your life more and more experiences at higher frequencies. So, I, you know, I think all of us can also do that as we start to clear away. Often, it's not even bringing in what's new. It's clearing away what no longer serves us. It's clearing away all of the so-called extensions of ego, which are hatred, jealousy, greed, pride, control, you know, arrogance, things of that nature. And replacing that, so that's the ego consciousness, and replacing that with the more soul consciousness. And the soul consciousness is love and open-mindedness and acceptance and compassion and trying to live from that place. Now, we're not perfect people. We're all going to fall short. We're not trying to also shame or punish anybody for not being a perfect person or make them feel bad for that. But whatever steps you can do, but first accepting yourself as you are and then taking steps to move in the direction that you want. That helps. All of that helps with the global hatred in a very big way. And that's very consistent with science of mind um, and also the laws of attraction, you know, which is a simplified version of pretty much what you're saying, you know. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think that's um, I think that's something people need to hear. You know, they need to hear that it begins with them. It begins with each one of us individually so that we can spend it out to um, our community. You know, that's, um, I think that's important. I think that we're, I think we're trying to, as a group, learn that through COVID, you know, starting with ourselves and our families and, and going forward, you know, and then something pops up that is horrible and we have to kind of back up a little bit because you know where there's light, there's there's dark. So you come from um, a little bit of a spiritual family. I'm not talking about religion because mm -hmm. I am feeling that you have grandparents that were pretty religious, not religious, spiritual. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Mom's very spiritual. My dad is like the scientist. He's like the very scientific physicist. My mom's super spiritual always, even though she also was a computer programmer. So I come from very math brain type people. And then grandparents, yes, I had um, rabbis um, in probably in both families if you go further, you know, far back enough. So absolutely. Well, you have a grandmother that's always around you. You know that. Yes. Yeah. Someone um, actually told me that. I think that's my mom's mother. Always she around that. you. Her she husband's was, name begins with a, her husband's name begins with a Y. Do you have a grandfather whose name begins with a Y? Oh, okay. Yes, but that's my other grandmother. That's so funny that you okay. said that. Yeah. She's always around you and she's pushing you and pushing you and pushing you. I feel like she's been opening up like your belief system for, for years to get you where you are today. Like you had to go through this journey, you know, and your own, you know, soul searching. So it's been, um, it's been pretty wonderful. I'm, I'm so honored to be with you. I think that the more medical professionals that come out and speak to this, the more the world, the more the United States will open up because we respect 
we respect education in this country. We respect doctors. We respect the medical community. And so when someone from the medical community like you or Dr. Alexander or some of the other people who have come forward and spoke to what their spirituality is or how it can heal or how it can help or their experiences, people do listen. And it's, 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 it's pretty wonderful and very courageous because you never know how your peers are going to take it. So I, I thank you from, from my heart, really from my heart. Um, if you people out there would like to connect with Dr. Yusim, you can do that by going to uh, her website, to Facebook, you type in her name, your name is on everything, correct? Um, what is your website address? It's just my full name, AnnaYusim.com, which is A-N-N-A-Y-U-S-I-M. So you can go and look her up. I suggest you do pick up her book, Fulfilled. It's a wonderful book. Um, and it's, um, it's an easy read, you know, so um, it'll, it'll touch your heart, touch your, touch your soul. So thank you for coming on today. I appreciate it. I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. If so, please like, share, and comment, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you never miss an episode. God bless you all, whoever you believe God is. May the angels protect and surround you as you go through the rest of your days. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you.